FOMO. My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I'm a FOMO Sapiens. And since you're here, I'm going to bet that you are too. And when you're like us and Monday comes around, you don't dread the new week. No, you wake up every Monday morning knowing that this week might just be the best one yet. This is Faux Monday, the snackable show that starts your week right with hot takes, life hacks, listener mail, and even some FOMO therapy. Welcome to another episode of Foam Monday, the snackable companion to FOMO Sapiens, which of course will be back on Thursday with a full episode. But until then, happy Foam Monday, best day of the week. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and FOMO Sapiens 24-7. Now on Thursday, oh, I have a great, great episode. This is a really, really great one. I love it. I am featuring Michael Waitchert, who is the author of a book called Hidden Mountains, Survival and Beckoning After a Climb Gone Wrong. It's about these climbers who are from New England. They all all climb in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and they're experienced but not professional. And they go on this very intense expedition in Alaska that goes horribly wrong and has major, major implications for their lives. And it's a story of how people, you know, I hate to say it, but I'm going to because this is FOMO Sapiens. The FOMO drives people to go to greater and greater extremes. And then things happen that are unexpected and there are real implications. So we're going to talk about that, how adventure sports is so FOMO driven and what it does to people's lives. Obviously, I'm not hating on adventure sports. There's lots of good stuff, but it is just a fascinating psychological phenomenon, also business phenomenon. We'll be talking about that with Michael. Now, as I thought about that book, I thought about danger because that it, the book is about danger and how people sort of get inured to thinking that doing something that's really intense. I mean, this hike they did, they, they got dropped off in the middle of nowhere and had to hike for days to get to this place they wanted to hike that had never been hiked before. That was their big goal in Alaska, where if you sort of have problems, like it's not easy. It's not like you can just walk to the end of the road and there's a gas station there. This is way out in the middle of nowhere. And so they took considerable risk. And I thought about that because as a traveler, as you guys know, I've been to, I think it's 113 countries unless I went somewhere that I don't remember. And anyway, I definitely, every time I go, my father is like certain place. Well, it's almost anywhere actually. It's like, don't go there. It's dangerous. And I'm like, it's not dangerous, but he's right some of the times. And yes, of course, it's not like I necessarily go in a reckless fashion, but you never know what can happen. Now, I want to tell you two stories from my own travels that I think kind of point out just how we just don't even think, I guess, or I don't anyway. Maybe maybe that's the, the story here. But two things that happen, which the my risk sort of you know bells went off in different ways but the outcomes were really different so the first one was about it was 2006 let's put it 2005 2006 i was in pakistan now i made an investment in pakistan i've been on the board of a pakistani company for a long time now i've been ever since 2005 called trg and at the time we were conducting due diligence And I was in Karachi. And this was a time that, you know, it wasn't like I was completely reckless. I mean, I knew bad things had happened. Daniel Pearl had been killed, the reporter. And so I knew to be smart and to be very careful. But at the same time, I wasn't that careful. Because, for example, when I showed up at the airport, there wasn't anybody to meet me. So I just took the the shuttle for the hotel I was staying in. And the company got really upset at me. It was not my brightest moment. Very nice shuttle, though. But that's not even the thing that I did that was a little nuts so one day one of the employees of the company and i got in the car and we had a friend in common actually who had been a classmate of mine in business school and she had a house at the beach and so he said you know what let's drive over to the beach you can see your house we'll you know take a picture of it and send it to her and you can just see a different part of the city and i thought well why not it's friday afternoon let's do this we get in the car we start driving we get outside the city into a part of town that's a little dodgy And then all of a sudden, the car just stops working. Like it just sputters and dies. We're on the side of the road. And, you know, we're both a little stressed. He's Pakistani. 
American. He has lived in both, but, you know, he's kind of more American at this point in some ways in terms of his sort of street smarts when it comes to what happens when your car dies. He didn't know what to do. And then I was sort of like, what are we going to do here? And so I just decided to go out and push the car. I tried to push the car. The car wouldn't start. And then a gentleman comes up to help. And this gentleman, I didn't know who he was. You know, he was, he looked... He looked like a perfectly nice person. But then again, you know, you never know. I mean, I just was sort of, you know how it is when you're in a foreign country and you don't know anybody and somebody approaches you and you have language barriers. And I thought like, ooh, is this going to be a problem? Now, it wasn't. He tried to help me push. Then he kept going. And then we kind of gave up and we're sitting in the car. So not a big deal, right? Until a Jeep full of like 10 guys with machine guns pulls up besides us and hops out. And then I thought, this is bad. Very, very bad. Thankfully, the person I was with spoke Urdu and so communicated. It turned out the car had a low jack system that had been activated. That's why the car wouldn't work. We knew, you know, the person, we had borrowed the car. So we got the person on the phone. They let us go. Everything was fine. But just that feeling when all the guys on the back of the Jeep with their guns pulled up, I thought like, this can't be good. Not a good situation. And so it was terrifying. I thought this could, this isn't, you know. I don't know if it's the end, but it's not, not, not the end. And I tell that story and, you know, it's kind of freaky, right? And yet everything was fine. We ended up going to the beach. It was lovely. Here I am today. Now, another time, it was a couple years earlier, I was in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt, flying out of that airport after a trip with my classmates in school. And we were flying to Aswan to go take a little Nile cruise. We had done New Year's in, in Sharm El Sheikh. We're at the airport. And I was sick as a dog. Oh my goodness. I was like, Oof. I had some stomach stuff. I don't know what the heck was happening, but I was not feeling well and I was kind of out of it, but we were waiting in line to get on the plane and there was another plane right beside us. It was all boarding. We were like, you know, we were like gates A and B and B was all French people. We were all from wherever they take off. We take off, we land, and our friend who had organized the trip said, everybody call your parents. The plane next to us, crashed into the Red Sea and everybody was killed. And we had one person on our trip who, her dad, when she called home, he was on the other line with the funeral home. People thought this was our plane, right? Now, my, I called my parents. My, my parents were having breakfast. They were chill. So they, <laughs> thanks, mom and dad. But uh, I'm glad I didn't freak them out. But that was funny because, not funny, excuse my language, but it was interesting to think about because I didn't perceive any risk, but that was I mean, that was a sliding doors moment in a sense, right? And so that is the thing about risk. The things that sometimes seem to be on the surface rather risky might not be. The things that seem mundane could be very risky. You, you have no way of knowing sometimes. That said, there are certain things that are risky and that, you know, you definitely uh, will, will increase your chances of getting hurt, right? Like bungee jumping and stuff like that. And so that is the nature of risk. And as we talk about this, I just wanted to bring those up. Now, what we're going to do, though, is just talk a little bit about how to assess risk. So what I want to do after the break is talk about how to assess risk in your own life, in your own activities, and how to frame it up. We'll be right back after this break. FOMO. FOMO. All right. We're talking about how to think about risk, which is, by the way, entrepreneurs. I mean, this is your business, Right. So many people, it's their business. They may not realize it. Are you a banker right now? If you're a banker, you're thinking about risk in a way you may not have before. And so here's kind of how I frame up risk. Number one, perception of danger is very subjective. What seems dangerous to one person is not dangerous to another. And I think we forget about that. We always think it's like a uniform level of danger. For me, walking down the street in New York City, not very dangerous, right? If you put my dad, <laughs> I love you, dad. He feels a little freaked out, right? For me, getting on a plane and a little plane feels really scary. I hate little planes. For somebody who's on little planes all the time, not a big deal. So it is important to understand it's all subjective and also to seek out people who seem more comfortable and learn from them. Like, what are you thinking about or how do you see this in a way that I don't? What are the stats, right? That's really important. Number two, mental preparation. So given what I've just said, the fact that it's subjective, at least to some point, I mean like swimming with sharks without a cage, that's just 
that is just dangerous. But the rest of it, there is a mental element and you can prepare, okay? Visualization, deep breathing, mindfulness. Say you're having a medical procedure, right? Nobody wants that. Even if it's not dangerous, you can work to prepare yourself emotionally, mentally to be resilient when you are freaking out. It works. And the more you do it, the more it's like a muscle that you can flex very easily. And so it's important to just prepare yourself mentally for what's happening. Number three, that being said, risk assessment. So do your homework. Anything you're doing, for example, when I fly an airline I've never heard of, I go online and I read about it or I ask people I know who know airlines just to understand like, is this a good idea, right? Is this is this something that is an unnecessary risk? I think that's the thing. Unnecessary risks, we all take risks, but taking unnecessary risks, that is just not something you wanna do. So you can do research, you can talk to people to better assess the risk of something. Number four, knowledge and training, and we'll talk about this on Thursday's episode. You know, the people who are in this mountaineering accident we'll be talking about with Michael on Thursday, it wasn't like they didn't know what they were doing. They were, they were prepared. They had trained, they had knowledge. And that's why things went a lot better than they could have, in fact. So having the right skills, the right equipment, being ready, that is oftentimes the line between dying and living. As you'll see in the story, they had certain things that kept them alive when, they could have died 100 years ago. So technology, I mean, technology plays a really big role in the story too because there's like all these different ways that you can communicate if you get separated. Even though it's still hard to get to where somebody is, you are in touch. So knowing what you're doing, training for it, getting the gear, all that sort of stuff, so important. Number five, emotional regulation. I'm gonna tell you something. When you are under stress, the more that your emotions fluctuate, the higher the risk of an accident. I didn't have to tell you that because you knew that, but it's true. And that's why you see, I always think about like gymnasts at the Olympics, the ones who are mentally tough, they just, they, they don't make mistakes in these really hard routines because they've done it a million times, sure. But the ones who are mentally fragile that do not have emotional regulation, they will fall even though they could do it perfectly 10 times out of 10, right? I think about that, figure skater from Russia who was accused of doping and she was like the best in the world. But the minute her emotional regulation went downhill, she fell like three times. It was actually super sad. Even, in, you know, carving out all the stuff about doping, which we don't, that's not what the show is about, but just watching somebody fall apart in a performance that they have prepared for and just so spectacularly, it was terrible to watch. Next, I talk about knowledge and training I mentioned it a little bit, but I do want to get into this a bit more. Safety equipment and protocols, right? So whether it's climbing, where there's so much, all the ropes and things that's so critical, whether it is being in the wild, right? So you got to respect the wild. Always pack what you need, band-aids, medicines, food, all that sort of stuff. Dress appropriately, all these sorts of things. Anything you're doing, unless you are truly, you know, if you're like a, true explorer where you're going to places nobody's ever been before. It's incredible the gear, the equipment that is out there today that's lightweight, that is affordable, that you can use. So invest in those things. Now, I'm not saying like, you don't want to be the person who has the satellite TV on the mountain. Of course not. But having good equipment is so critical. And then also thinking when you're doing activities with others, obviously like making sure that you kind of divide those things so that you can all share what you're packing up. That can really make a difference. You hear about this all the time. And technology, of course, again, as I mentioned before, it can be so important in this. So making sure that you have the latest tech so you can be connected to things, huge. Finally, acceptance and flexibility. Be ready, know what you're doing so that if things don't go your way, you can pivot. And this is one of the things in the story from Thursday is that in the book really shows this in a pretty powerful way is their plan A wasn't working out and they stuck with it when they could have pivoted to plan B and been fine. So it's sometimes you gotta turn back. And I remember I worked for this guy called Tim Purcell, who was my boss at JP Morgan, and he had climbed Everest and he got to the basically the top, very close, and he had to turn back. Now, I always wondered, like, how do you know where the top is? And I found out later, you do, there's a way to know. But he had to turn around because if he had kept going, he would have died. 
it was that kind of thing where like those minutes mattered. And so sometimes you have to be flexible. You have to accept that you can't reach the goal and you have to do that because otherwise you will die. Now, obviously, we don't want to climb Everest. There's other ways in daily life, right? I don't mean to make it so dire. But thinking about being flexible, right? It's like the reed bends when the wind blows on it. It doesn't stay straight. The ones that are straight break. So the bendy reed is the one that's more resilient. Be the bendy reed. Don't be the inflexible one. And you will be so much more successful. All right, everybody. You're going to love Thursday. I'm telling you, you're ready for it now. But uh, I will see you then. Until you, until I see you, don't do anything crazy. And uh, take care of yourselves, FOMO sapiens. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO. Want more FOMO Sapiens and FOMO Monday? Head over to FOMOSapiens.com where you can listen to past episodes, learn more about the show, and find out how to advertise. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis and on Twitter at PJ McGinnis.